Hey, good day everyone. Welcome back. Today we will be addressing the second topic in our course on database design and management. And this topic is going to be the relational model. We have several objectives for this topic. First, we're going to try to learn about the conceptual foundations of the relational model and try to understand the differences between a relation and a regular table. I'll also be introducing you to some of the terminology associated with the relational model. And a major part of today's lecture is going to be to try to familiarize you with the concept of keys. There are many different types of keys in database modeling, and we will explore these different types of keys today. Further, we will learn how one of these types of keys, specifically a foreign key, is used to implement relationships between tables within the relational model. Toward the end of the lecture today, we will move into a discussion of something known as normalization, the normalization process, and we will talk about normalization in the context of dependencies, and we will introduce the process for normalizing our relations. So let's begin. First, I'd like to talk today about something known as an entity. In the database world, we can consider an entity to be something that is important, and we want to store information about this entity in the database. Conceptually, an entity should represent a single theme or a single business concept. For example, an employee might be an entity, a department might be an entity, a project might be an entity. Each of these is a single business concept about which we might want to track information on several different attributes. Using the employee example, we may want to track the employee's name, the department in which the employee works, the employee's telephone number, and so forth. We are going to be learning much more about entities when we explore our fourth topic, which will address the entity relationship model. Next, I'd like to talk about a concept known as a relation. A relation is a table. If you recall last time, we said that a table is essentially a two-dimensional grid which contains both rows and columns. A relation is a specific type of table. That is, in order for a table to qualify as a relation, the table must have certain characteristics. Let's see what these characteristics are. As you can see on your screen, several conditions must be met in order for a relation to qualify as a table. First, the rows in the table must contain information about instances of an entity. For example, if we are working with an employee relation, then each row in the table would represent a single employee. Columns in a relation are used to represent the attributes of the entity. Using our employee relation as an example, we may have several columns, such as an employee ID, or an employee name, or an employee telephone number. The values stored in the column are all going to be, in this example, employee ID numbers, employee names, or employee telephone numbers. Within the table, we have cells. A cell can be thought of as the intersection of a row and a column. In order for a table to qualify as a relation, the cells in the table can only hold a single value. That is, we are not allowed to store more than one value in the same cell. Further, all of the values within a specific column must be of the same data type. For example, if we create an employee ID column, we would specify its data type. We may, for example, use an integer data type for the employee ID. 
This rule says that all of the values which appear in that column then must be integers. Further, every column must have a unique name. This is necessary so that the database, the database management system, are able to determine which column it is to which we are referring when we are making requests of the database. We could not, for example, create two columns in a table that were both called employee ID. It is possible to have multiple tables in a database and we may have an employee ID in one table and an employee ID in another table, but we cannot have two columns within the same table that have the same name, such as employee ID. Another characteristic of a relation is that no two rows within the table can be identical. This does not mean that we are not allowed to have identical values within a column as we move from row to row, but rather this is saying that if we consider the row in its entirety, if we take all of the values in the row together, they cannot be identical to any other row in the table. And then the final two characteristics are of a relation are that the order of the rows and the order of the columns cannot matter. Let's take a look at a sample relation. As we see, here we have a table which contains three columns, employee number, first name, and last name. The table also contains four rows. Each row in this table represents a single employee. And you will note that this table meets all of the characteristics that we discussed on the previous slide. So here we see a table with three columns, employee number, phone, and last name. But this table has several problems with it that mean it cannot qualify as a relation. The first problem is if we look at the values stored in the phone column for employee number 100. Here we have more than one value stored in this cell. In a relation, we are not allowed to store more than one value for an attribute within a given cell. Another problem with this table that disqualifies it from being a relation is that two of the rows are identical. We see that we have two rows which have employee number 100, a phone number of 215-7789, and a last name of Cadley. Remember that when all of the values for a row are considered together, there must be something that is unique about the row. No two rows can be identical to each other. If they are, the table does not qualify as a relation. What we can take from this example is an interesting point. That is, all relations are tables, but not all tables are relations. So that's an important point that you can remember. Let's further expand our database vocabulary a little bit by looking at some synonyms. Depending upon which textbook you read, or which lecture you listen to, or which database manager you are speaking with, you may find that different people use different words for the same concept. This is quite common in the database world. Examples here are table, relation, and file all generally refer to the same concept in the context of the database world. Note that in the modern era people will rarely refer to a database table as a file. Other synonyms include row, record, and tuple. So the horizontal data structure within a table might alternately be referred to by one of these words depending upon with whom you're speaking. Finally, the vertical data structure within a table might alternately be referred to as a column, a field, or an attribute. These all refer to the same concept within the broader context of the database world. Now we're going to move on to a new topic and this is a critically important topic for understanding the relational model. And that is the notion of keys. The general idea here is that a key is a column within a relation whose values are used 
to identify a row. Now keys come in many different varieties. Some keys are unique and some keys are non-unique. If a key is unique, what that means is that the values within the key column will all be unique within the entire table. For example, if we have an employee table which contains an employee ID, no two employees would be allowed to have the same ID. That would be a unique key. On the other hand, we have non-unique keys. And in non-unique keys, the idea is that the value of the column may be the same for more than one row within the table. Non-unique keys are generally used to categorize the rows within a table into groups. For example, if I have an employee table, one of the attributes might be department ID. So let's say that department ID number two is the accounting department. In this case, the department ID is a non-unique key within the employee table, and more than one employee may have a value of two for the department ID attribute. In the coming slides, we will take a look at many different types of database keys. But before I begin this exploration of keys, I wanted to present what I call Dan's topology of database keys. And I hope this will help you to understand the relationships among the different types of keys that we will discuss today. So you can see that all database keys can be subdivided into two major groups, unique or non-unique. Among the non-unique keys, we will discuss something called a foreign key. And among unique keys, you can see that there are several different types of unique keys. Candidate keys, composite keys, primary keys, and surrogate keys. We will begin by examining a composite key. Remember that a composite key is a unique key, according to Dan's topology of database keys. And a composite key is called a composite key because it is composed of two or more columns. So that is, we combine the values of two or more columns together in order to get uniqueness. This is sometimes a challenging concept for people to understand initially, so I think the best way for us to explore the composite key is through an example. Let's imagine that we want to take a flight from Orange County to Washington, D.C. So we are going to purchase a ticket for this flight, and our flight will have a specific number. For example, we might be on flight number 34. Within the airline industry, a given airline might operate flight 34 once every day, and what that means to the airline is it's a flight from Orange County to Washington, D.C. So flight 34 is a flight from Orange County to Washington, D.C., and we make that flight once every day. Because flight 34 occurs every day, we cannot use that value, we cannot use flight 34 to uniquely identify a specific flight. That is, a flight with you know, a real airplane where a specific group of people get on board and fly from Orange County to Washington, D.C. In order to get uniqueness, we would need to combine that flight number with another piece of information. And one piece of information that we could use would be the date. Let's look at this table that's currently shown on your screen. As you can see, we have United Airlines Flight 36, and it exists in more than one location in the table, which means that the value of UA36 is not unique. However, if we combine UA36 with the date upon which that flight took place, those two values together are unique within the table. And this is true for all of the flights that are listed within this table. If we examine the flight number column, we can see that it's possible to have more than one flight with the same flight number. And if we examine the date column, we can see that it's possible to have 
more than one flight on the same date but the combination of a flight number and a date is unique. We could therefore combine those two values together and use them as a composite key. Next I would like to talk about a candidate key. A candidate key is called a candidate key because it has the potential to become something that we call a primary key. So just like in a presidential election, a candidate has the potential to become the president. In the database world, a candidate key has the potential to become the primary key. And if you remember Dan's topology of database keys, a candidate key was the second of our four types of unique keys. Since a candidate key has the potential to become a primary key, it's important for us to understand what a primary key is. As is currently shown on your slide, a primary key is chosen to be the main identifier for a relation. That is to say, the primary key is a unique key, and if we know the value of the primary key, then we will always be able to locate a specific single row within the table. For example, if I have an employee relation which contains a primary key column that is named employee ID, and I know that the employee ID in which I am interested is employee ID number two, I should be able to uniquely identify a specific employee, just one employee, within that table. Let's see an example. Here we have a table with three columns, employee number, first name, and last name. In this table, we are using employee number as the primary key. That means that if I know a specific employee number, I should be able to locate a single specific employee within the table. For example, if I know that the employee number in which I am interested is employee number 107, there should only be one employee number 107 within this entire table, and I can then use that value to identify the employee. In this case, Sheer Anavi. The next type of key that I would like to discuss is called a surrogate key. Now, a surrogate key is a unique key. It is typically a numeric value, like an integer, and it is intentionally added as a new column to a relation by the database designer for the purpose of serving as the primary key. Surrogate keys are often used when we do not have a column within the table that would naturally serve as a unique identifier, that is, as a primary key. On the previous example, we saw an employee table that contained an employee number. In that example, the employee number really had no meaning. The numbers were 100, 101, 102, and so forth. Those numbers had no meaning outside of the database. In that case, we might consider employee number to be a surrogate key. One of the common uses of surrogate keys is to avoid having to use a composite primary key in a table. Let's see an example. Here we see our airline flight table again. We have the flight number column and the date column. And we said in a previous example that if we combine those two values together, we can get uniqueness. But in this case, we've added an additional column which I've called flight ID, and it's just another way of ensuring that each row is unique. I can uniquely identify each row simply by knowing the flight ID. Our next topic is to discuss relationships between tables, and here we will introduce a concept known as a foreign key. In the business world, it is very common for relationships to exist among business objects or business concepts. For example, employees can work in departments. In most businesses, each employee will work in just one department, but each department may contain many different employees. As another example, 
each project within a company may be assigned a project manager, but each project manager may simultaneously manage many different projects. So these business concepts, these business themes, are related to each other. In the database world, we establish relationships between the tables in our database by using matched pairs of values. To establish these relationships, we need to implement something called a foreign key. Put simply, a foreign key is a primary key from one table which is added or placed into another table for the purpose of linking the records in those tables together. The key value is called a foreign key in the table that receives the new column. So we create a new column in a table that is the primary key from another table. This new column is called the foreign key in the table which receives that column. Here we see an example. On the left we have a project table which is just represented here by its attributes. So each project contains a project ID, a project name, and a manager ID. On the right we have a manager table which contains two columns. They are the manager ID and the manager name. In this case manager ID within the manager table is the primary key and we have placed manager ID into the project table to serve as a foreign key. In this way, if we know the manager ID for a specific project, we can easily determine the name of the manager by using that ID to look inside the manager table. In this example, we have two tables one named department and one named employee. Here we have added department ID which was the primary key in the department table into the employee table where it will serve as a foreign key. In this way if we know the department ID for a specific employee we can follow that relationship over to the department table and use that information to determine the name of the department in which the employee works. One of the very useful capabilities that we gain by using these primary key foreign key relationships is the ability to enforce something called referential integrity. Now put simply, referential integrity means that each value of a foreign key must match a value of an existing primary key. And the database management system in enforcing referential integrity helps us to preserve the quality of the data in our database. For example, here we have a project table shown toward the top and a customer table shown toward the bottom. If I want to add a new project to the project table, in this case it's going to be project number 113, and I propose to link this new project to customer ID number 5, what referential integrity means is that the database will look in the customer table and will check to see whether a customer with customer ID number 5 actually exists. If customer ID number 5 does not actually exist in the customer table, then the database will not allow me to add the new project. Note here that customer ID in the project table is acting as a foreign key to whereas customer ID in the customer table at the bottom is the primary key. Also note that in the project table at the top more than one row can have the same customer ID. In this case we have two rows which have customer ID number two. This simply means that these two projects, DB Upgrade and New Email Server, are both associated with our second customer, whose name in this case is Priya. Customer ID is a foreign key, but as we can see, because more than one row can have the same value for the customer ID, 
This means that foreign keys are non-unique keys. If you recall Dan's topology of database keys, remember that we subdivided all database keys into two groups, unique and non-unique. And on the right side of your screen, we can see that foreign keys are non-unique. Hopefully, you, based upon the previous example, you can understand why. The next topic that I would like to discuss is that of null values. In the database world, a null value simply means that no data exists within a particular cell. That is, you can think of this as an empty cell in the table. Note that a null value is different from a zero, a space character, an empty string, or a tab character, or any other character. A null value is empty. It's nothingness. Null values in the database world are sometimes beneficial, but they can also cause us problems. The reason why is that null values can be ambiguous. A null value can potentially mean many different things. For example, a null value might indicate that the proper value for a given row has not yet been determined, or a null value might indicate that the proper value is simply not known, or is missing. If you recall, when we were discussing our previous topic, we described some of the problems with lists, and we saw that when we use a list approach for storing data, the potential exists for us to add new rows to the list which contain many different null values, many different empty cells. One of the great advantages of the relational model is that it helps us to design data structures in such a way that we can minimize, or in many cases, entirely eliminate empty cells within our tables. To achieve this, we need to go through a process called normalization, which I will discuss a little bit later. First, however, I would like to talk about something called a functional dependency. Now, this is a very technical term for a very simple concept. A functional dependency is simply a relationship between the different attributes within a table. And it says that the value of one attribute can be used to find the values of other attributes. As an example, if we know the price of one delicious Girl Scout cookie, and we know that a box of Girl Scout cookies contains 12 cookies in total, then we can use that information, the price of a single cookie, and the quantity within a box, to determine the price of a box of cookies. That is to say, the cookie price and the quantity determine the box price. The box price is functionally dependent upon the cookie price and the number of cookies in the box. In this case, the attributes on the left side of our screen, that is cookie price and quantity, are called determinants because we can use those values to determine the values of other attributes within the table. Next, let's review some interesting characteristics of the relational model. We learned earlier about candidate keys. If an attribute within a relation is a candidate key, by definition, it must functionally determine all of the other non-key attributes in the row. Recalling that a candidate key will eventually be selected and promoted to the status of a primary key, then by extension, a primary key must also functionally determine all of the other non-key attributes in the row. Let's look at some examples. Let's say that we know an employee ID. If an employee ID is a candidate key or a primary key, by definition, we should be able to use that employee ID to find the values of the other attributes in the row that are associated with that employee. In this case, we have two additional attributes in our relation named employee last name and employee phone. And 
we can see that if we know the employee ID, we should be able to find these other attribute values within the table. Similarly, if I have a project table and I know the project ID, the project ID is a determinant and I can use the project ID to find the values of other attributes associated with a given project. In this case, project name or the start date for the project. Now we can introduce the concept of data normalization. Although I will describe the normalization process here, we will come back to this topic again in a future lecture. Data normalization then is a process that a database designer goes through in order to determine if a relation is what we call well-formed. A well-formed relation is one which is not susceptible to the three types of anomalies that we described in our previous lecture. If you recall, we described three different types of anomalies. They were deletion anomalies, update anomalies, and insertion anomalies. A well-formed relation is not susceptible to any of these types of anomalies. So another way of thinking about the data normalization process is that we are attempting to create relations in which we can insert new data, delete existing data, or modify existing data without creating one of these anomalies. There are two major design principles that are associated with the normalization process. First, as a general rule, we need to remember that in order for a relation to be considered well-formed, every determinant within the relation must also be a candidate key. That is, every determinant in the relation must also be a candidate for promotion to the status of primary key. Our second principle is that if we encounter a relation that is not well formed, we're going to need to break that relation apart into two or more smaller relations with the goal of making those smaller relations well formed. I'll now give you a very important tip that will help you to learn to design well-formed relations, and that is simply this. As a general rule, a well-formed relation will not encompass more than a single business concept. If you have a relation that contains non-key attributes for more than one business concept, then it is almost certainly not a well-formed relation and we will need to break that relation into smaller relations in order to successfully complete the normalization process. Let's look at a few examples. In the first case, we have a student ID, which is a determinant. And if we know the student ID, then we might also know the name of the student, the dorm in which that student lives, and the cost of living in that dorm. However, if the cost of living in the dorm can be determined by the name of the dorm, then we're going to need to break this relation apart into two relations. In this case, we would have a student relation, which contains student ID as a primary key, student name, and dorm name as a foreign key. And then we would have a dorm table, which contains dorm name as the primary key and dorm cost as a non-key attribute. Here's another example. In this case, assume that we need to record meetings between an attorney and one of the attorney's clients. To describe the meeting, we would need to know the attorney's ID and the client's ID. That is, if we know the attorney ID and the client ID, then we can determine the name of the client, the date upon which the meeting will take place, and the duration of the meeting. However, if a client ID 
can be separately used to determine the client name, then the client name should be removed from our original relation and placed into its own relation using client ID as the primary key. In this case, the result would be one table which contains attorney ID, client ID, meeting date, and duration, and within this table, attorney ID and client ID together determine the meeting date and the duration. And then we have a second table, which contains two attributes, client ID and client name. Within this table, if we know the client ID, we can easily determine the name of the client. Client ID in this table serves as a primary key, which links the clients in the table back to the meeting table. Within the meeting table, client ID serves as a foreign key link. What we see on your screen right now is a series of steps through which a data designer must move in order to ensure that a relation is well formed. Our objective for this class is going to be to normalize our data tables until the point where they are in something called third normal form. In order to arrive at third normal form, we will need to get our tables into first normal form and then into second normal form, eventually arriving at third normal form. It is important to note that there are higher normal forms which have been defined, fourth normal form, fifth normal form, sixth normal form, and so forth. However, for the purposes of this class, and for the purposes of the vast majority of business data needs, third normal form is more than sufficient. Let's begin then by defining first normal form. One easy way to think about first normal form is that a relation is in first normal form if it does not contain any multi-valued attributes. Another way of saying that is that every attribute value is atomic. We are not storing more than one value in each cell of the table. An extremely important point to remember is that all relations are, by definition, in first normal form. At the beginning of this lecture, we talked about the characteristics of a relation. And we said that all relations are tables, but not all tables are relations. If a table meets the definition of a relation, that table is also, by definition, in first normal form. Here we see an example of a table that is not in first normal form. Again, by definition, that means that this table is not a relation. How can we tell? Well, the table contains multi-valued attributes. That is, for the same order within this table, we have multiple values stored in our product ID, product description, product finish, unit price, and ordered quantity columns. Because we have more than one value in each cell, this cannot be a relation, and is therefore not in first normal form. Here's an example of the same table which is in first normal form, and by definition is also a relation. So what we can see here is that each cell within the table contains one value, a single value. That is, values within the table are atomic. Next, I'd like to talk about second normal form. A critical point to remember here is that in order to qualify as being in second normal form, a table must first meet all of the criteria of first normal form, and then it must meet an additional criterion. Specifically, beyond all of the requirements of first normal form, every non-key attribute within the table must be fully functionally dependent upon the entire primary key. This means that 
the values of the primary key must be able to fully functionally determine the values of all of the other non-key attributes within the table. Another way of saying this is that we cannot have any partial dependencies among the attributes within the table. Here we see an example illustrated in something called a dependency diagram. Looking at this relation, we can see that the relation has a composite primary key. The attributes which comprise the composite primary key are order ID and product ID. We can identify these because they are underlined. Now, what this means is that the combination of an order ID value and a product ID value should be able to uniquely identify every row within this table. However, we see that we have partial dependencies within the table. On the right side of the relation, as an example, we see that several non-key attributes, namely product description, product finish, and unit price, are dependent upon product ID. That is, those values are not dependent upon the entire primary key. If I know a product ID, then I also know the product description, the product finish, and the unit price. I do not need to know a product ID and an order ID in order to know the product description, finish, and price. This is called a partial dependency. Although this relation is in first normal form, it cannot be in second normal form until we remove these partial dependencies. In general, the strategy that we use for moving from a lower normal form to a higher normal form is to break the relation apart into smaller relations. So if I want to go from a first normal form relation, which is shown here, to a second normal form relation, I will need to break this relation apart into smaller relations. On this slide, we see that we have taken our original relation and broken it apart into three separate relations. At the top, we have a relation called order line, followed by a relation called product, followed by a relation called customer order. By breaking our original relation into these three relations, we have removed all of the partial dependencies. That is, if I look at the non-key attributes in any of these three relations, I will find that all of those non-key attributes are fully functionally dependent upon the entire primary key. For example, looking at the product relation, I can see that the primary key is product ID. If I know a product ID, then I also know the product description, the product finish, and the unit price. Although we have removed the partial dependencies, we still have a problem with our relational design. Namely, within our customer order table, we have something called a transitive dependency. In order for our relational design to be entirely in third normal form, we are going to have to eliminate this transitive dependency. In order for a relation to be in third normal form, then, it must meet all of the criteria of second normal form, plus it cannot have any transitive dependencies. A transitive dependency is a functional dependency on an attribute which is not the primary key. We call these dependencies transitive because the primary key will determine one non-key attribute, and that non-key attribute in turn will be a determinant for one or more additional non-key attributes. As is always the case in the normalization process, the solution is to take our relation which contains a transitive dependency and break it apart into smaller relations. In this case, we want to remove 
the non-key determinant and the attributes that depend upon that non-key determinant and put them in a separate table. What we've done is we've taken our previous customer order relation and we've broken it apart into two separate relations, one of which is named order and the other of which is named customer. Both of these relations are now in third normal form. That is, they contain no partial dependencies, they contain no transitive dependencies. Note that we have retained customer ID in the order table as a foreign key link which points back to the customer table. Thus from our original relation we have created four separate relations in order to achieve a relational model which is entirely in third normal form. To many people who are new to relational modeling this whole process of normalization can seem quite confusing and quite challenging. I promise that with a little bit of practice it will become second nature to you. The most important point to remember with respect to designing relations that are in third normal form is simply this. Each relation should contain attributes that are related to one and only one business concept or business theme. If you can remember that single rule, then you will be able to easily create relations that are in third normal form. Well, my friends, thus ends our lecture on the relational model. Come back soon, and we will explore our next topic. Until then, have a great day.